Have your copy of God's Word, and I pray you do. I'd invite you to open to Matthew chapter 5. If you're following along in a Black Pew Bible, it's on page 810. I tell you every week, and I will continue to tell you, that if you don't have a Bible, that new Black Pew Bible is your new Bible. It's a gift from Oak Grove Baptist Church. We just ask that you read it and obey it. Now, in keeping with the theme of today's uh, service of, of being led by our next generation ministry, they have asked the young preacher to preach this morning, uh, since you had one of the older guys last week. Thank you. That's a good Father's Day gift to me. I appreciate that. Uh, one one uh, thing I do want to clarify uh, on a serious note. A couple weeks ago, I made an announcement about the Southern Baptist Convention. And there have been some, some real misunderstandings about what I said. And so I thought I, I, thought I was clear, uh, but I'm, I'm hearing from different ones that, that there's some, some murmurings going around uh, where folks misunderstood what I said. Uh, number one, uh, I've been told that, that Jimmy is pulling us out of the SBC. Uh, that is fully uh, uh, untrue. Uh, I do not have the authority, nor do I have the desire to do that. Uh, what I said was uh, the staff would bring a motion at our July business meeting to discuss the possibility of escrowing uh, the money that we would normally give to the SBC until all of the uh, investigations have concluded into the sexual abuse allegations. It's a very, very serious sin and we need to be very sober and, and, and prayed up on what we're going to do with our uh, cooperative program money. Uh, I've been told that, that we're holding missionaries hostage. That is not true. The money is still being sent there and will be, will continue to be sent there until the church congregation decides whether or not we stop it. That is not up to me. It's not up to the staff. That is up to Oak Grove Baptist Church. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to monitor what's going on. The SBC, the annual convention was this past week in Anaheim, California. And they did address this situation. It was the number one topic of conversation uh, at the July business meeting. We'll, we will have time to evaluate what was done. We'll present a report. And as a church, we'll make a decision. Prayerfully, uh, the, the changes that they're making will be enough that we can say, praise the Lord. They're doing something about it, and no action will need to, to be taken. But we are not out of the SBC. We are not seeking to pull out of the SBC. No money has been withheld whatsoever from any organization or any missionary. So I just want to make that abundantly clear so that we're all on the same page. All right. Amen. Let's get on to this. <laughs> Over the past several years, there has been an anomaly in the social media realm. It's called the social media influencer. Uh, over the past decade, people have made a career out of simply advertising things online, whether it's makeup or, or how you do your hair or all that kind of stuff. You'd be surprised how, how lucrative of a business this is. Uh, 3.5 billion people around the world use social media, 45% of the world's population. These influencers leverage their knowledge and their expertise to shape and mold the culture. They build credibility and trust through regular posts and blogs, and they impact thoughts, feelings, and responses. Now, name brands love influencers because they create trends and they create fads that bolster sales. Now, somebody once said leadership in its purest form is influence, and, and I believe that there, I don't believe in coincidences, and I, I don't believe that it's a coincidence that today's sermon about leadership and influence has occurred on Father's Day. Uh, I didn't plan that. God did. Uh, because I can say personally from my own life that the greatest influence that has been in my life is my dad. Uh, he, he taught me a lot. My dad's not a theologian, but he taught me the difference between squeezing the trigger and pulling the trigger. He taught me the difference of, of, of jerking a hook into a fish's mouth or setting a hook in a fish's mouth. He taught me how to be a man. He taught me how to have honor. He taught me how to have respect. He taught me how to treat my wife. Uh, he was, whether he knew it or not, and I'm sure he didn't know it, uh, those, those little feet following along behind him watched everything he did. And he is the greatest influence <clears throat> on my life. Uh, Jesus calls us to be influencers on this world. Uh, as, as Christians, 
we, I believe we have been left here to influence the world for the kingdom of God. We have a very specific job. Uh, the church's lack of influence is one of the greatest threats that we face today. The British pastor James Stewart said this, quote, The greatest threat to Christianity is not communism, it is not atheism, it is not materialism, it is not humanism. The greatest threat to Christianity is Christians trying to sneak into heaven incognito without ever sharing their faith, without ever living out the Christian life, without ever becoming involved in the most significant work God is doing on planet Earth. Over the last seven weeks, we've been in a series called Everyday Disciples, laying the foundation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the theme has been very simple, that disciples make disciples. We are in the multiplication business. We are in the reproduction business. We need to value people the way that Jesus valued people. We need to see people the way Jesus saw people. We need to connect with people the way Jesus connected with people. We need to serve people the way that Jesus did. We do all of those things so that we can then influence them. Now, Jesus was the most influential person who ever lived. Plato taught for 50 years, Aristotle for 40 years, Socrates for 40 years, 130 years combined of these great philosophers and thinkers, and they pale in comparison to the influence that Jesus Christ had in just a three-year ministry on earth. Amen. Amen. Jesus never painted a painting, but the greatest works of art and the greatest artists use him as their influence. Jesus never wrote a song, but the most beautiful songs from Beethoven to Bach have been written about this one single solitary life. Jesus wrote no poetry, but the greatest literature and the greatest works of art all in history have been inspired by him. But Jesus used his influence to accomplish the greatest work in the history of the world, which is bringing people to God. And he wants us to do the same. He wants us to leverage our lives to influence people to come to God. And in the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of the world, Jesus shares a simple secret on how we can be people of influence and make an eternal difference in their lives. We're going to take our text this morning out of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 16. It's on page 810 of your Black Pew Bible. It is on the screen right now, and if you would, and if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Heavenly Father, on this day that we set aside to celebrate our earthly dads, We celebrate you first and foremost, our Heavenly Father, the one who created us and the one who through his son Jesus has sought to recreate us, to reconcile, Lord, to restore us to that place that sin stole us from. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his obedience to you and his love for us, that he was willing to sacrifice his life on a Roman cross shedding every drop of that precious blood that washes away all of our sin. But Lord, we know that when he died on that cross, he said, it is finished, not I am finished. And we know that on the third day, he rose from the dead. And his glorious resurrection affords us eternal life. Lord God, I pray that your spirit will be here among us. I pray that everything that we do, from the first word that is sung to the last amen that is offered, would bring you, our Heavenly Father, honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute. 
Uh, you're, you're saying that I can be a person of influence. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything. I, no, but before you think that, imagine the setting of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is not in Rome talking to military generals. Jesus is not in Athens talking to great philosophers. Jesus is sitting on a hill speaking to people in a place called Galilee. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Galilee, uh, we might say that they're the, the Duck Dynasty folks. Uh, my, my generation would say Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, they were kind of the honey boo-boos uh, of the time. Uh, they, they were rural, hard-working, blue-collar people. And Jesus says to them, you are the light of the world. And they're probably saying, you talking about me, Jesus? Me? Little old me? But they were. He was talking to them. He's talking to us today. And because these people were the light of the world and the salt of the world, Christianity is on every continent today, and we are here this morning because of what they did. Because they were influencers, and that influence continued to trickle down to us. See, we can, as an everyday disciple, be an influencer. We can shape and mold our culture, and we can change our world. We can make our world better, and we can make our world brighter through Christ Jesus. Jesus gives us two simple things that we can do to become a person of influence. First, he tells us to preserve a decaying world. You are the salt of the earth. Why does Jesus refer to his followers as salt? Salt is one of the most useful substances on the planet. It, 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 it occurs naturally. God gave it to us. And there are several things that, that, that salt does that are beneficial to us. Uh, the first, it gives flavor. It gives flavor to everything that it gets put on. Uh, what does salt taste like? Well, it tastes salty. There's no other way to describe it. You know if there's not enough salt on your food, and you certainly know if there's too much salt on your food. I know some of you put salt on your food before you taste it. And I will tell you, as someone who makes sausage gravy at the men's breakfast, that hurts my feelings just a little bit. But we're so used to doing it, we don't even think about it. We just grab the salt shaker and we start... That's one influence my dad didn't have on me, because that's something he does that I don't do. Now, salt enhances the flavor of food. What does it have to do with Christianity? Oh, wait a minute. Is this a prosperity gospel sermon? Nope. Because what many pastors will do is they will stop at that, and they will say, you know, Jesus will enhance your life. He makes life taste better. And he does. But that's not all he does. See, because if, if, if we're just simply telling people, Jesus makes your life better, listen to what Jesus said just two verses before. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. That doesn't sound like life enhancement to me. Being persecuted and being reviled? That's not what people want. We, we don't, they, that's not a way to influence people and make friends, is to be reviled and persecuted. And yet Jesus said that we would. And so while Jesus will enhance your life, that's not something we can cling to. Friends, this is not your best life now. Unless you don't know Jesus. Because if you do know Jesus, there's a better life waiting for us. If you don't know Jesus, I pray. I pray that today will be the day that you open up your heart and come to him in faith. Now, flavor is important, but that's not the full purpose of being salty. Second, it's used for healing. Salt is a natural anti-inflammatory and antibacterial uh, substance. It is it used to reduce congestions, to sanitize, and to open airways. It's used to treat asthma, allergies, bronchitis, COPD, even the common cold. It hinders bacteria and keeps infection out of wounds. And in this world of sin and brokenness, Christ is the healing that this world needs. Isaiah 49 says that he is going to be the healer of the nations. And friends, 
Our nations need healing, amen? amen? Our world needs healing. And Jesus tells us to go out into that world and bring that healing by being the salt of the earth. Third, it creates thirst. Live lives that make other people thirsty for Jesus. Live in a way that people look at you and they say, there is something about you that I want. There's something missing from my life. And then you have the opportunity to tell them about Christ. Make them thirsty for Jesus. It's also a preservative. 2,000 years ago, there was no refrigeration. When these fishermen caught fish, they had to immediately pack the, the, the fish in salt or it would rot. Poultry, beef, all preserved in salt. Salt prevents co corruption. It prevents decay. Uh, they would pack all of their food with salt. One of the ways we can become a person of influence is by allowing your life to be sprinkled out like salt. But finally, and I think the most important, is for purity. Salt was used to purify. It was required in every sacrifice burned on the altar. Salt has a purifying effect on everything that it comes in contact with. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 4, it says that newborn babies were washed and rubbed with salt. Salt was important back then. Salt's important today. See, it has a, a cleansing ability. It, it, it's a, a process called fluctuation. In which the, the, the particles, the, if, you take, if you get a mud hole and you pour salt in there, all the, mo all the molecules, all the particles will clump together and sink. So if you pour salt into muddy water, it's not too long before it becomes clear. Because that salt has a purifying effect. God wants us to go out into the world and show the world what a purified life looks like. Not perfect. Because we're not perfect. We're never going to be until we get to heaven. But we are purified. And we need to show that to the world because this world desperately needs that. Chuck Quarles said one time, the use of salt as a purifying agent overlaps somewhat with the use of salt as a preservative. Salt preserved because it first purified. And here's the point Jesus is making. We can have a tremendous influence in the lives of others. These five things that I just mentioned to you. We can bring all of these into the lives of those who don't know Jesus Christ. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Jesus built the wheel. He gives us the privilege of coming along and telling others how to be an everyday disciple. You see, being an everyday disciple is not something that we keep to ourselves. It's something that we go out and we share. Our salvation simply is not about us. Our discipleship is not about us. It is very important that we study the Bible, study it every day, read it every day, hide its words on your heart that you might not sin against God. But being a Christian is not about life improvement, remember? It's not about life enhancement. It's about sharing Jesus with the world. It's not just about being a blessing to ourselves. You see, we, uh, uh, to be quite frank, if I could write off the world, I would. Because the world is a dark place. But Jesus didn't write off the world. Jesus came that the world might be saved through faith in him. Now listen to what Jesus said. We are the salt of the earth. He didn't say we're the salt of the church. All right. We can't salt the world if we're not out in the world. Because the purpose of salt is to get onto and into food. We have to be the salt of the earth out there. Salt is worthless unless it's put on food. It may look nice in the shaker, but unless it's shaken out, it is absolutely worthless. Listen, the church is the salt shaker. And you are the salt. When you leave here, you are being poured out into the community, into the workplaces, into the schools, into the neighborhoods, into all the places that you go to show others the difference that Christ has made in your life. I heard a story about a woman who went to a mom-and-pop grocery store, and she asked the guy, she said, do you sell salt? 
He said, lady, take a look around. She looked around the store. There was nothing but salt. Iodized salt, Morton salt, kosher salt, uh, every single kind, sea salt, rock salt, whatever, whatever you could imagine. He had it in droves. I mean, it was, it was incredible. The woman said, that's amazing. He said, let me tell you, I'm going to show you something else. He took her down into the basement. The basement was five times the size of the upper store, filled to the walls with salt. She said to him, this is absolutely incredible. You really do sell salt, don't you? He said, no, that's the problem. We never sell salt. But that salt salesman comes here every week, and boy, he sells salt. <laughs> Listen, salt that's not poured out is worthless. It doesn't do any good. We have to get out of our churches, out of our homes, out of our holy huddles, and we've got to get into our neighborhoods and our schools and in our groups We've got to show people the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. Listen, Jesus gives us a warning here, verse 13. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. See, it's, it's almost impossible for salt to become unsalty. Uh, sodium chloride is one of the most stable chemical compounds in the entire world. But if you had lived back in Jesus' time, you would have understood what he meant because back in those days, people got most of their salt from the Dead Sea. Uh, the highest concentration of salt anywhere on earth. And once the waters would flow in, you can see that those aren't waves, that's not icebergs, that is salt. It, it pours up there, it dries out, it crystallizes uh, right, on the, right on the shore. Now this salt is a combination of, of salt and minerals. So there is enough salt there to preserve meat, but there's also enough minerals in there to dilute the flavor and make it bitter. It makes it almost inedible. The only thing that people would do with that kind of salt was use it to keep the dirt down on the roads. They would pour it out on the roads and they would walk over it. They would trample it. You see, Christianity loses its flavor and the church loses its attractiveness when we become diluted with the things of the world. So not only does salt purify, when we are showing people that we are salty, we have to be purified in order to do it. We can't walk the same direction that the world walks. We can't talk the same way that the world talks. We can't laugh at the same filthy jokes that the world laughs at. We have to be different. We have to show them what a purified life looks like. Remember the sermon a few weeks ago? We don't conform to the world. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, too many people believe that Christianity in this country is being shut down. They, they talk about persecution in America. Friends, if you believe that, you don't know what persecution really is. Because there are people around the world giving their lives for their faith, literally. They're dying in the streets. See, the problem in America is that we're not being persecuted. We're being ignored. Because we've lost our influence. We're losing our saltiness. As we're becoming the Rodney Dangerfields of America. No respect. Whose fault is it, friends? It's the church's fault. See, followers of Jesus will never make followers of Jesus until we act a lot more like Jesus. People know when food is salty. They know when it's not. And people should know by the way we live our lives whether or not we're really disciples of Jesus. This decaying world needs preservation that comes only through Christ. Second, Jesus tells us to penetrate a dark world. The second thing Jesus says, verse 14, you are the light of the world. Now it's interesting that Jesus calls us light. The Greek word is phos. Or we get phosphorus, we also get photograph. So what Christ is telling them is, you are a photograph of me. When you go out into the world, people are to see me. Who did Jesus say he was in John 8? light of the world. That's what we're to do. We're to reflect that light. Listen, Jesus says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. That word set means to be placed or to be planted. You know what that means? That means that you're at your workplace, not by happenstance. I told you earlier, don't believe in coincidences. You are there because you have been placed and you have been planted by the sovereign hand of God to be an influencer on all of those people in there. It's funny, there's so many cliches 
You may be the only Bible that people read. You may be the only gospel that people hear. That's not just nice coffee cup slogans. That's real. I really believe that, that when we get out of our holy huddle and we get out into the world and we really start to share the gospel with people, you're going to find out how dark the world is. How dark this world is. It's very dark. Someone once said that darkness doesn't really exist. It's just the absence of light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Penetrate into that darkness. We've all been set here to be a city on a hill. Now, a city on a hill can't be hidden. It, it's not something that you can, you can put a, a shroud over. It's there. Back in those days when they built towns and cities, they didn't have bulldozers like we do now. So whenever a, an invader would come in and destroy the city, burn it down, they didn't take a bulldozer and push it all away and rebuild. They just rebuilt on top of the ruins. And so after a while, this process continued to go and continued to go until most cities were built on hills. You can't hide that. It could easily be seen. And too many Christians live their lives like they're in the Secret Service. Our faith is to be lived out in public. It's to be lived out everywhere we go. Oh, he switches from a light on a hill to a light inside of a home. Verse 15. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. Now, I would venture to say if I took a show of hands, and I won't, Every one of us have electricity in our homes. I think we would all agree to that. Do you know why? Because we don't like to sit in darkness. But we, we don't like to stay in darkness. And, and I, I can affirm that because every time that uh, the, the, the lights flicker on Connolly Road, I say, not again. Because we're in an area where we lose power a lot. And listen, burning candles is very sweet the first hour. It's very romantic. Second hour, getting old. After five hours, I'm losing my mind. Because you can't take a shower, you can't watch television. i got a three-year-old. And, and, if, and if she doesn't have cocoa melon every hour, there is wrath to be had. And, and so we need BG&E. Turn the power back on. I'm sick of sitting in the dark. We need light. Who, who is the, the greatest influencer in the home? Because Jesus is talking about a home here. He's talking about a lamp now. Dad. I already told you my testimony. Dads are to be the number one influence in the lives of their children and their wives. So guys, step it up. If you're not leading in your home, do it. 18.3 million homes in America. There's no daddy. This is a blight on our society. Why is the crime rate so high? No dads. Why don't boys know how to be men? Because there's no daddies around to show them. Because too many of these so-called men are really just boys who shave. They would rather spend time sitting in their parents' basement playing video games and not out raising their children that God has blessed them with and that they're responsible for. And yes, there are wonderful single moms. And if you single moms, I applaud you. That, that's, that's wonderful. Because you're doing double duty. Pray for your children. Raise up your children in the church. But men need to be responsible. You don't have to be perfect, but you need to be present. Show your children how to read the Bible. You know what two of the greatest things that you can do for your kids? Let them see you study God's Word and let them see you pray. Because what that will show them in their little lives as, they're being, as their minds, their physical and their mental and their spiritual lives are being formulated is that my daddy prioritizes Christ Jesus. It's real in his life. Love your wife. Respect your wife. Serve your wife. 
Show your children how to be a husband, how to be a father. Don't leave it up to society to do it because I promise you will lament it for the rest of your life. You got one shot with your kids. Make it count. On this Father's Day, thank your Heavenly Father. You may have had a dad that was a dud, and that happens. I just said there's 18.3 million homes without a daddy. And maybe you were raised that way, and you say, how can I trust the Heavenly Father when I can't even trust my earthly father? Because your Heavenly Father, or your heavenly father doesn't sin. Because your Heavenly Father is always there. He's always with you. He is, he is right next to you any time you call out His name. If you're a dad and you're estranged from your kids, call them up. Seek and grant forgiveness. If you had a dad that was a dud, if you have a dad that's an un unbeliever, go to him and be salt and be light to him and tell him that you love him and that you want him to have the joy and the peace and the hope that Jesus has given to you. If your daddy's gone, if he's already dead, forgive him and move on with your life. Let go of any hurt that he put on your life and turn your life over to your Heavenly Father because he will never let you down. God put us here to be a light in dark places. He put us here to shine the light in those dark places. So say a blessing over your meal. Put a Bible on your desk. Let people know that you're praying for them and that you would love to pray for them. Invite them to church. Be, be what God created you to be and do what God puts you here to do, which is to be salt and light into a dying world. See, Jesus, as he said in John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, Jesus is the difference. Friends, we, we are not different because we gather together on Sunday and, and have a, a worship service. Other religions do that. But we are not different simply because we don't cuss or gamble or smoke or drink. Because other religions, believe it or not, have stricter rules than Southern Baptists. The only difference is Jesus. Jesus makes all of the difference in our lives. And the more of Jesus we have, the saltier we become. And the more... Jesus that we allow to govern our lives, the more and brighter our light is going to shine. Because Jesus is the light that he's talking about. He is the true light of the world. And he wants us to let him shine through our lives. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to be a, a theologian. You don't have to have a certain position to let your light shine. Let me ask you a question. What's the most important light in your house? Is it the chandelier? in the foyer, or is it the little night light that keeps you from breaking your neck when you go to the bathroom at night? I think we all know the answer. It's not how bright, it's not how brilliant you are that matters to God. What does matter to God is that we're willing to open up our heart and our mouth and let his light shine through us. Don't let darkness intimidate you. Light will always overcome darkness. Light is never afraid of darkness. Walk into a dark room and turn on the smallest little light bulb. Darkness will flee. And others will be attracted to that light. Jesus concludes by saying this, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And that's the purpose of all of it. Is to live lives that bring glory to God the Father. Now, how do we know if we're really shaking out the salt and letting out the light? Because when people look at us, they're not going to say, wow, aren't you a great person? They're going to say, wow, you know a great God. Now, there are some very practical ways that you can let your light shine. Uh, we have been uh, promoting, and in your bulletin this morning, there is an insert about bless every home. Take that out and take a look at it real quick for me. You, you can go online... You can register, and I, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but I'll go into a little greater detail. You can see this map. This is an actual map, a screenshot that Matthew took uh, about uh, the areas that we've already prayed for in this, in this 
general vicinity. Uh, so far, I believe, if you go to the next slide, we have, what, uh, 16 lights that are reaching 882 homes. Uh, every day, you're going to get an email with five uh, names and five addresses in, in your vicinity. Put it, put in your zip code and where you live. You're going to get the, this email with, with these names and addresses, and then you pray for them. And as of right now, we have 5,506 homes that our 16 lights are praying for. Now, the statistic that I heard was that if we invite people to church, one out of five will come. As it is right now, if we invited all 5,500, we could have 1,100 people here. Nobody said amen. 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 Why does that matter? Does that matter because our pews will be filled? Or our coffers will be filled? Or we'll get a big tithe offering that day? No. It's because those 1,100 extra people are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they may come to glorify our God and our Father. That's why we do what we do. Now, I will tell you this. You can pray for these people or you can kick it up a notch. You can write a little note to them every day. Hey, at Oak Grove, we pray for our neighbors. We pray for our community. We're lifting you up to the Lord. If you have a specific prayer need, let us know. Or if you really want to get brave, if you really want to do some shaking and some shining, we have some, we have some little drop-off bags, little gift bags from Oak Grove. It has one of our devotions in it. It has some brochures. It has an, a personal invitation. You're invited to Oak Grove. They're up here on the, on the Lord's Supper table. Matt's got them out here at the West Foyer. Pick them up. You can go to your neighbor's house. You can put it right on their doorknob and leave. You don't even have to engage with them unless God sets that divine visit up. But you can become a light in your neighborhood today. What a blessing. What an absolute wonderful way for you to spend your life. Sharing with those people that live the closest to you the Savior that you love so very much. There was a little boy one day who asked his dad, he said, Dad, how tall am I? His dad said, well, son, I guess you're about four feet tall. He said, well, how tall was Jesus? He said, well, the Bible says that he, there was nothing extraordinary about Jesus. He was probably 5'10". And so the kid said, well, Dad, if, if I'm four feet and Jesus is 5'10", and Jesus is in me, won't he stick out of me? And the answer is yes. If Jesus is inside of you, he sticks out of you. Where everybody can see it. They, they can see and, and experience your saltiness. They can see your light shining. He will stick out of you. Friend, you're either salt of the earth or you're part of the earth. You're either living and shining the light of Jesus or you're living in darkness. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Life is available through faith in Christ Jesus this morning. The Bible says today is the day of your salvation. Give your heart to Christ. He will make you the salt of the earth. And he will pull you out of darkness and into his glorious light. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise and thanks for who you are. We thank you that because of our faith in Jesus, because of his sacrifice, we can come before you today and call you Abba Daddy. And we know that when we come in his name, Father, you hear our prayers and that you love us and that you're mindful of us. God, I pray on this, this secular holiday that we set aside to honor our earthly fathers, that there will be healing through forgiveness if it's necessary, through reconciliation if it's necessary, through restoration of broken relationships if it's necessary. And Lord, we thank you that because that the Holy Spirit lives inside of each and every one of us, those things are possible. We don't operate like the rest of the world. A believer that is motivated by joy and propelled by the Holy Spirit is a powerful thing. So Father, I pray that you would motivate us with your joy, and I pray that you would propel us with the power of your Spirit. 
to be salt and light into this world. And for those here today, Lord, that don't know you as Savior, Holy Spirit, do during this time of invitation what only you can do. Stir their hearts, reveal their sin to them, and then show them the way to the foot of the cross and faith in Jesus. And it's in his name I pray these things. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you want to truly be able to tell him today, Happy Father's Day, Father. The Bible says that he is faithful and just, that when we call out to him, he will forgive us of our sins, that when we trust in him, we can have abundant and eternal life right here and right now. All you have to do is cry out to the Lord. Maybe you need to be baptized, maybe you'd like to join our church, or maybe you need someone to pray with. Our staff's going to be down front during the invitation, so please come as the Spirit moves you.